Dominican, Cuban. My dad is from Chile, NPR, which means I'm Chile, Dominican, Rican. <laughs> but I always say I'm from Queens. In the Heights was a show about the Latin experience. I don't know, it's just a sense of love, I think, and community in just the Latin culture. And, and to be able to portray that on stage was just really wonderful. And there was a part of me in a story and in a music that's not normally seen on Broadway. And that was really wonderful to see that. And being a part of the In the Heights creative team is, is a huge honor. And it's something that, you know, it's hard to top something like that. That is musical polymath Alex Lackamore. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Alex Lackamore is an arranger, musical director, orchestrator, conductor, and musician. Probably best known for his collaborations with Lin-Manuel Miranda, In the Heights, and Hamilton. A graduate of the Berklee College of Music, he began his career on Broadway as musical director of Bat Boy the Musical. He worked extensively with Stephen Schwartz on the national tour of Godspell and on Broadway with Captain Louie and Wicked. But it was his work with Lin-Manuel Miranda that brought him a Tony Award for Best Orchestration for the musical In the Heights, making Alex the first Latino to win that award and the first Berkeley graduate to win a Tony. Alex followed that with a Grammy for Best Musical Theater Album for In the Heights, and repeated the process in 2016 with the Tony and a Grammy for Hamilton. I spoke with Alex Lackamore in a New York City rehearsal room. He had spent the day working with the Chicago cast of Hamilton to prepare them for their opening, and he would spend the evening, as he does every evening, serving as the show's conductor on Broadway. Yet he was extraordinarily gracious and generous with his time, And as you'll hear, we spoke until we were thrown out of the room because the building was closing. There was a lot to talk about. First of all, again, thank you. Oh, my God, thank you. But I need to begin with the basics, and I'm going to sound like a complete moron. But (laughs) I'm just going to put it out there. I'm sure you won't, but okay, go ahead. (laughs) I really would love to tease out what an arranger does versus a musical Uh, director versus an orchestrator. Sure. I'm... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's a very good question because they're all uh, very different jobs and there are certain music directors who do all three things and there are certain people who only do one of the three, but they can all be related. So in terms of a music director, that to me is just kind of uh, the job of just directing the music of the show, meaning teaching the music to the actors, rehearsing the band, possibly conducting the band, being the liaison between the composer and the cast, you know, just the kind of mechanics and the, the management side of things. Then for arranging, that to me is kind of about the big picture of a song. Things such as trying to see if the key is in the best place, wondering if the tempo is the right tempo. Uh, you know, this is all based of, um, off a of composition, for example. So you'll have the song composed, but then the arranger might say, hey, you know what would be good for this? Let's have like three backup singers singing a harmony at this bar and that bar. And how about we add a couple of extra bars of music at the end just to give a nice satisfying payoff so that the audience knows when to clap. So, you know, adding things like that, maybe deciding if there's a moment where the entire band drops out to highlight a certain lyric or deciding that things, uh, you know, that the piano part should sound like this or like that. That's kind of what arranging is. And and a good example, I think, for that is, you know, you can have a, a song and the song at its core is the melody, the lyrics, and potentially a hook or a riff in the song but you can have several arrangements of the same song. So you just look online and you just type in, you know, popular song like All About That Bass, and you see that there's the original version that Megan Trainor did, but then there's also a very cool version that someone did that sounds like a very kind of like jazzy version with like an upright bass and jazz horns. So it's the same song with a different feel. So that's a different arrangement. And then for orchestration, that is really about the detailed work. That is about taking a a pencil to paper, or in my case, a computer, (laughs) and deciding what the actual instruments in a song is going to be and writing down what every instrument is going to be doing. So in the case of Hamilton, as an orchestrator, it was my job to say, okay, I really feel that a 10-piece band is the best way to present this music. And, you know, I could have said it could have been 15, it could have been 8 or whatever, but that was creatively what I thought was the best way to make the sound of Hamilton the way uh, that I felt it should sound like. 
And then it was my job as an orchestrator to actually write down exactly what the violin plays, exactly what the drummer plays, exactly what the bass player plays, and do that for every bar <laughs> in the show. So it took me eight months to orchestrate Hamilton because it's two and a half hours of straight music. <laughs> and so with a, it's, it's a big show. So um, that, that is the detailed work. So it's some of those little touches, like that beautiful cello that comes in and wait for it, mm, mm -hmm. which I, I wait, for, I mean, I wait for that <laughs> cello. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> it's thank so you. beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you know, and those are choices that I, as an orchestrator, make. Like, for me, it's about filling spaces, meaning uh, I, as a listener, like when something is there to kind of hold my interest, if you will. So in this moment, this cello line that you're talking about, you know, there was a, a space that I felt needed to be filled. So, you know, uh, Burr has that line, but there are things that the homilies and hymns won't teach you. And then the bass line has been playing the figure, so then I decided, you know what, why don't we have the cello complete the thought that the bass line was having? Because no one's singing, we have this little void, so it's time to have a fill, if you will. I'm willing to wait for it. I'm willing to wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. My grandfather was a fire and brimstone preacher. There are things that the homilies and hymns won't teach you. Teach you, teach you, teach you. My mother was a genius. My father commanded respect. When they died, they left no instructions. Just a legacy to protect. So it was all about just deciding what would be the best instrument there. And for me, it, I like something. I like the idea of having something low. I like that burr as being very kind of contained and, and something about that low register of the cello felt like the right instrument to be using because I could have filled that space with something else entirely. It could have been a guitar. It could have been a violin. But for me, the characteristics of that instrument, the cello, it just felt like it was the right thing to answer that question that was posed. Well, thank you. That really helps a lot. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> sure, sure. And it's a great question. You, you know, those are words that you hear a lot, and it's really hard to define what they do because it's very, uh, you know, amorphous. How did you and Lynn manuel work together? This is the third show you've worked on together. Yes. How do you how do you collaborate with one another? How does it work? Well, I love working with Lynn manuel for the obvious reasons, the biggest one being that he's an absolute genius at what he does. And uh, what's great for me uh, as a, a writer myself is that Lynn is extremely collaborative. What I love about Lynn is that he is so clear about where he wants a song to go. And he's able to compose it in a way that I know what it is that he's trying to say a as, a, as a composer. So what Lynn usually does is when he writes his song, he uses his computer and he uses a software called Logic. And Logic is great because you can, track by track, build the song either using existing loops inside the software or by actually sitting down on a keyboard and playing the sounds yourself. So Lynn will make a demo where he's played a piano part, for example, like uh, to give the basic chords of something. He will have found a bass synth sound and will play a bass line, find some cool drum sounds and play that himself. So he track by track just plays it all out. He'll record his vocals on top of the demo, maybe give some ideas of where he wants harmonies to be. Then he presents the demo to us, to the creative team. So he'll bring a demo, he'll email it to, to me, to our director, Tommy Kale, to our choreographer, Andy Blankenbuehler. And from there, we get in a room, and then we just talk about what Lynn has brought in. Sometimes I'll sit down at the piano and give my representation or my, my thought about what it sounds like on a piano, which might be very different than how it sounds on his computerized demo. But in that process, I tend to kind of throw things in that are kind of my flavor, like maybe some piano lines that are just the way I approach the piano. I might suggest spots where the piano could just drop out and then you're left with silence to come back in a bit after that in order to highlight a particular lyric. So in that process, we try things and I'll ask Lynn as I go, like, hey, what about this, what about that? And he'll either go, that's great, I don't like this, I don't like that, but I do like this part of it. So it's a very back and forth kind of thing. And what's great is that Lynn, I feel, trusts me enough that he doesn't need to be kind of like looking over my shoulder at everything that I do. I can present him a demo of my own along the way, or I can have him come into the room after I've taught all the vocals for a song for him to approve all the harmonies I've done. And I'll have him sit next to me while they're singing, and I'll be like, do you like this that they did? He'll be like, yeah, that's great. And, you know, if, if he hears something that he doesn't like, he'll be, yeah, let's look at that. This is why this isn't working for me. And then I'll say, well, what about this instead? And then he'll be like, yeah, that's great. So it's a, a back and forth that I love because it just feeds off each other. You know, he presents such great ideas and then I'll be able to present some of my own and he'll either go with that and maybe that will give him yet another idea and then we'll arrive at something. But 
what's wonderful and gratifying for me is to know that because of suggestions that I've made, I make an imprint into how the music sounds. And that for me is extremely a, a wonderful feeling because I get the sense that Lynn wants me to be a part of his music. I get the sense that he enjoys having me there. So I just try to bring my A game and just do him proud along the way. <laughs> is there a song that you collaborated on in Hamilton, for example, since mm -hmm. that's the most current one sure. that you're particularly proud of that you just love just love to death? Sure, of course. Well, I mean, there's a lot. All of them. I know that's <laughs> it's a all hard of them. one. I know. It depends what day it is. Sure, sure. I mean, one that comes to mind is uh, One Last Time which once upon a time used to be called One Last Ride uh, back off Broadway. So those who saw Hamilton at the public got to actually see the, the song that eventually became One Last Time, and it was called One Last Ride. And I remember how we would work on it. I remember being in my, in my home office, and Tommy Kale, our director, and Lynn Manmo were there. And we got to the point where we wanted to use Washington's farewell address and use the text of that in the song. And I remember we were all just sitting around and looking at the actual text of the real farewell address and trying to pare it down to the essential piece of it, maybe like, you know, paraphrasing a couple of words here and there. And what Lynn was going for was this kind of very flowy thing where one person would be talking something and another person would be singing. And he got inspired by the Obama Yes We Can video, which uh, kind of has a similar thing to that. And I remember at first, Lynn had said, yeah, I want to sing this and we'll have Chris Jackson speak it. And I remember saying, Lynn, why don't we flip it around? Like, why don't you speak it and have Chris singing? Because why do you not want Chris Jackson singing anything? And then he was like, yeah, that's great, great idea. And then um, he knew very clearly that he wanted that section to be based on the chord progression of the song, The Story of Tonight, which appears earlier in the show. And we left that meeting with a clear idea of what we wanted it to sound like and feel like. And then basically from there, they had left, and it was just me in my room with the computer and just sitting down at the piano, looking at the phrases of Washington's farewell address and setting them to notes. And in my head, I was thinking to myself, you know what, if Chris were here, this is how I think he'd sing this, and this is where I think it fits really well in his voice. So really, phrases like, you know, I anticipate with pleasing expectation that retreat, in which I promised myself to realize the sweet, et cetera, et cetera. That was me channeling Chris Jackson, <laughs> actually, you know, writing down notes that I thought would sound good in his voice. And uh, fortunately, they did resonate with Chris, and he did like them, and that's what became part of the song. I anticipate with pleasing expectation that retreat in which I promised myself to realize the sweet enjoyment of partaking in the midst of my fellow citizens. The benign influence of the good laws of a free government, the ever favorite object of my heart, and the happy reward as I trust of our mutual care. The shape of that in terms of how many measures of music fit certain parts of bars, that was something that I came up with myself and presented it to the boys, and they would be like, yeah, that works. Um, same thing with the ending you know, of One Last Time. That was, um, it used to, for a moment, end with a wordless vocal. And it had this beautiful line that Lynn had written that was just on a da-da-da sound. Da-da-da-da-da-da. And uh, that's what the ensemble used to sing. They no longer sing that. That line itself is somewhere in the strings earlier during the farewell address. And I remember thinking, you know, Lynn had come up with that great phrase, George Washington's going home. And we, had, we were using it earlier in the song. And then I thought to myself, Lynn, instead of a, a wordless vocal, what if, if we use the lyric? And he's like, play me what you mean. And then I sang, George Washington's going home over a different chord progression that he had composed it over. And then when he saw that they both fit together, it just felt like the right message. It felt like what we wanted to send the father of our country with. And it just felt like it had more meaning than just da 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 da's. One last time. George Washington's going home. Teach him how to say goodbye. George Washington's going home. So that's just an ending and a whole section of a song where I feel like, again, you know, those were things that Lynn had kind of said, here, here are the ideas that I have. These are all the different motifs. These are all the different pots on the stove. And me being like, okay, well, here's the meal that we can make out of it. Why don't we put it all together in this way? And uh, that, that's a song that I'm particularly proud of. Oh, yeah, I would be too. I love that song. How did you come to music? I've been playing piano since I was four years old. 
it's just was something. your family musical you know my parents weren't they don't play any instruments you know legend has it that i was a kid at two years old like sitting in front of a stereo speaker staring into the speaker as music was playing just transfixed just transported and there was just something about music and sound that just always called to me yeah i just uh, started playing piano since i was four and I, i've never looked back did your parents get a piano for you yeah uh, i had a toy piano there was a very popular song at the time called Music Box Dancer, and I just loved it. It was actually an instrumental pop song where the piano takes the melody, and I remember having my toy piano trying to play Music Box Dancer on this toy piano, and I don't know if I was playing the right notes at all. I know it was definitely banging in rhythm, but uh, because of that, they were like, ah, just give the, give the kids some lessons, and uh, I had a couple of lessons uh, with a couple of teachers, and I, do, uh, I was told the story when I was older that uh, one of the piano teachers actually, after having a couple lessons with me, <laughs> called up her own piano teacher crying because she's like, I don't know what to do. I've taught this student everything that I know and he knows more than me now. I, don't, I gotta pass him on to you. <laughs> and this is when I was like, I don't know, five or six or something like that. So I, I guess I, I was very precocious and, and uh, enjoyed the instrument. Both your parents are Cuban, but they met in the United States. They met in the United States. I know. It's, it's, you don't usually hear that happening in that in way. In L.A. In L.A., not in Miami, <laughs> which is funny. Then they did the right thing and moved to Miami. Yeah, I think that was the right thing for all of us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they, they gave L.A. a try, and God bless them. And, you know, we had family out there trying to guide us along the way, but we had more family in Miami, and then it all just that kind of clicked in that way. Did you grow up listening to Latino music a great deal? Cuban music is, is so powerful. Oh, it's extremely, yeah. It's so rhythmic and, and it's trance-like in, in a way. Yeah. But no, you know, I wasn't, when I was young, I was way, way into pop radio. And I learned my classical pieces, but in terms of what I listened to, it was like top 40 all the way. Like, especially, you know, when I was in L.A. In, LA in the early 80s, like Culture Club, Tonsum Twins, you know, Wham, <laughs> whatever it was. <laughs> and so I really was, was more keen to that music. And then when I got to Miami, that's when I started listening to Latin music, but not by my own accord. It's just like it was on at the parties that I went to. So really, in Miami, you go to a Christmas party or a Thanksgiving party, there's salsa blasting for four hours. So just being around that stuff, I didn't realize that I was paying attention to that music, but I was definitely subconsciously paying attention to that music because when it came time to orchestrate in the Heights, I knew so much that I didn't know that I knew. Yeah, that's and uh, we're it's like I, I automatically, like once I got a couple of tips and read like this amazing book about how to arrange for salsa, I'm like, oh yeah, I know all this stuff. It was stored away in my brain somewhere just by the exposure of it. So, um, you know, I would listen to more Latin music more during In the Heights in preparation for orchestrating the show. But uh, by no means was I a connoisseur of, of, of Latin music, at least not the way my sister is or, or my, my family is. In the Heights, does that have a special place in your heart? Because okay. it's a Latin-infused musical created by Latinos, sure. about Latinos sure. in a Latino neighborhood. Absolutely. I mean. It's super special. And, you know... Uh, there's no other show quite like it. And I think what you said is what's really, uh, something that was really wonderful for us was, yes, it was a show about the Latin experience written, you know, <laughs> there were people on the creative team who were Latin. There are other shows that try to portray the Latin experience, but there aren't Latinos in, in the creative team, I mean, like Kate Man or West Side Story, for example. And uh, I don't know, it's just a sense of love, I think, and community in just the Latin culture. And, and to be able to portray that on stage it was just really wonderful and just, to, you know, there was a part of me in a story and in a music that's not normally seen on Broadway. And that was really wonderful to see that. And being a part of the In the Heights creative team is, is a huge honor. And it's something that, you know, it, it's hard to top something like that. The set, there, there are many wonderful, wonderful things about In the Heights. You know, the score, the music, the orchestration, the thank cast. You. Sure, thank you. Everything. Yes, everything, of course. The set was Kind Amazing. Of jaw dropping. Oh, wasn't it great? Yeah. yeah, Anna Luisa did our set, and she did a fantastic job with that. I remember that her and Lynn and Tommy would just take trips around Washington Heights, just like looking around and being like, oh, look at this, look at that, and just getting that feel on stage. And my wife was born and raised in Washington Heights, so she saw that set, and she was like, oh my God, like, this is no joke, but my wife, uh, you know, the apartment she grew up in in Washington Heights, the view out her window was basically our set. <laughs> <laughs> like that view of the George Washington Bridge. And, you know, th th that's someone from th the hood who, like, says we got it right. So that's nice to know that we had that piece of authenticity there. Do you have a special moment in that play that you particularly love, either wow. in the creative process or the way it finally appeared on wow. stage? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, you know, Carnival, 
comes to mind, which is a great song. And that's a song that underwent a huge transformation, I feel, not only from its workshop phases until what we ended up with, but even between the off-Broadway phase to the Broadway phase, that song was very different. And there was a whole chunk of that song that didn't exist when we were off-Broadway. That whole section about that, uh, Usnabi saying, you know, I'm going to fly this flag that I got in my hand. That whole Parriba Esa Bandera, that whole refrain of Parriba Esa Bandera, Lynn wrote that, you know, in the fall before we got to Broadway. And I do know that even the ending of that song, we were a little stumped because it didn't quite end in a way that felt satisfying. And our producer, Jeffrey Seller, and, and Kevin McCollum had said the same thing. They just felt like the number wasn't, like, paying off. And I remember being in a room here in this very building at New 42 uh, on the sixth floor in the back room, just all of us just kicking around ideas of what it could be. And Lynn referenced the end of America on West Side Story, how the music just kind of like kind of spirals and gives you like. And with that, just somehow we kind of unlocked the key that ended up being the last eight bars of Carnival that wound up being the finale of that song as we have it now. That was just a song that I just loved the collaborative piece of it because even with Bill Sherman, my co orchestrator and arranger, you know, all the harmony bits for that we came up with ourselves. And Andy suggested certain elements of rhythmic pulses that he wanted, and Bill Sherman and myself would put that into the orchestrations. So that was a very collaborative thing where all six of us on the creative team just really kind of created that song as it is. And, and that, that was a, a, a moment that I, I loved. Yeah, it's a great song. It reminds me of the streets of Washington. Oh, Heights, I'm which glad is you liked it. You were the conductor and won enormous praise Thank you. for the excitement that you managed to get from that orchestra that people say, you just don't hear this on Broadway, which <laughs> thank is you. great. Uh, thank you for saying that. You know, like Hamilton, In the Heights, both those shows have a particular kind of music that you don't hear on Broadway very often. Therefore, the kinds of musicians required to play that music is a very smaller pool. And in both of those cases, I'm super proud of the band that we got together to play that music because I feel like we played it authentically. I feel like we played it with like muscle and with real power in a way that just felt emotionally and organically right. So um, I love both of those bands very much. And I really feel like, you know, they made my job easy just because they knew how to do it. <laughs> and to be in those bands and playing keyboard and conducting and just being a part of that. There, there's just nothing like that. It's an absolute thrill. How did you move into musical theater? So that for me happened in junior high school. So I went to an arts junior high school in Miami called Southwood Middle School. And I started a summer early. So uh, we're talking the summer of 1986. I had just turned 11. And the drama department of the school was putting on the summer musical, which was Bye Bye Birdie. And they needed a bass player for that band, the pit band. And they couldn't find someone who actually played the bass. But what they did have was a small keyboard that was probably an octave and a half. That was a bass keyboard. And they actually asked me if I wanted to play bass keyboard in the band for Bye Bye Birdie. And I was like, sure, no problem. <laughs> I mean, meanwhile, now, like, what the hell are they doing asking an 11-year-old to play in a pit? But clearly, I guess they had enough faith in me that they decided to ask me to do it because everyone else in the band were adults. Or, you know, there were some high schoolers as well in, in the band. Um, but I was like this 11-year-old, like, nerd <laughs> playing this keyboard. And something about seeing peers of my age on a stage, singing a song, being in costume and performing something and in that collaborative community way, it just really spoke to me. And there's just something about that group of, of students. They were just so outgoing and so fun and just so like performery. <laughs> I don't know. There's something that I loved about it and I just got bit by the bug. And, and then I tried to just kind of hang out with the theater kids as much as I would hang out with the music kids. And then I just became known as the one who like, liked to play piano for theater stuff. So, you know, I got into Pippin, I got into Godspell and everything else Stephen Schwartz did and they would have a, a showcase of a review of musical theater songs and they wanted to do a song from Ain't Misbehaving so they would get me to be on stage and play a Fat Swaller tune. So there was just something about theater and the way it intersected with the music that I'd like to do 
that just really just just spoke to me. You are also hard of hearing. I am hard of you hearing. You are hard of oh, hearing. Oh, I don't know if you can see. I'm wearing hearing aids right now. And no, I, I can't. Ears. You know, and it's funny. I'm always amazed that people don't notice them because if someone's wearing hearing aids, that's the first thing I notice. Maybe it's like part of a secret club <laughs> that I'm in. But yeah, you know, uh, they discovered it when I was about four. I guess maybe around the same time I picked up piano. My parents got me hearing aids. And at the time, those were, the, you know, the only kind that were available were those huge behind the ear suckers that just like are behind your earlobe. And I was very, very self conscious about them. And, you know, uh, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. And I remember one time I either broke one or a new model came out and we could only afford for me to have one. <laughs> so I would walk around with one hearing aid. And in junior high school, I was, that's when it's so important to be cool. And I got so many questions about what's that behind your ear? And I'd be like, oh, nothing. So I stopped wearing it. I went through all of high school, not wearing hearing aids and, you know, feeling very bad for all my friends who had to repeat everything for me three times because I couldn't hear it. Once I got to college, I'm like, you know what? Enough is enough. I need to start hearing what's happening in well, the world around you're me. Especially Berkeley. Exactly. By then, the, you know, what they call the in-the-canal earring aids were much more available. That was the new technology. So these are the kind that I, wear, that I wear that go kind of way more inside the ear. You don't notice them unless you're really looking for them. You don't notice them at all. But what's great is that the hearing loss that I have, it's mostly like in the high frequencies. So you and I will be listening to a stereo. I will still hear that stereo, but like I hear it at a lower volume than you do. So you're going to want to probably lower it at the point where I'm going to want to raise it. The same thing with higher frequencies like consonants and hi-hats and triangles. Those kinds of things I don't hear very well. As a matter of fact, one time we were mixing uh, an In the Heights record. And I, I remember saying to the mixer, I'm like, uh, can we turn up the triangle there? Like, okay, he turned it up. I'm like, I don't hear the triangle. Turn it up, please. And he turned it up. I'm like, guys, where's the triangle? And then everyone in the room looked at me like, Alex, if we turn up the triangle any louder, this song would be a triangle concerto. <laughs> It was just a frequency that I just don't pick up on. So for that kind of stuff, I just read to other people and be like, uh, you tell me if the triangle's in a good place because I'm not going to be the best judge of that. But uh, fortunately, you know, I do hear the big picture. If I'm not wearing my hearing aids, I can still play the piano and hear it all. You know, I can still listen to music with headphones and hear it all. But my frequencies on the higher end might just be a little kind of uh, compromised, if you will. If you had to guess, do you think because you're hard of hearing, you have that focus, you listen so, you can listen so intently? I think so. And I don't know. It's funny. I've asked myself I mean, that same knows, question. And who knows? Yeah. I think part of it, yes, absolutely. I, I think I, I am more attuned to certain things because, I, like you said, I listen harder, more intently. But at the same time, I do feel like my brain just sees music in a mathematical way, if you will. Like when I'm reading sheet music, like I see a chart. Like I'm not looking at a staff and look at a chord and be like, that's a C and that's an E and that's a B. Like I see a shape and my hand knows how to read that shape in such a way that I am not reading particular notes, but I'm seeing design, if you will. So I, I know that I've definitely got that OCD quality, you know, from I think that's kind of a prerequisite for being an orchestrator <laughs> anyway. I do feel like, yes, it's part of it is the listening thing, but also visually I see music in, in a certain way that just has a uh, shape to it. Oh, yes, yeah, so they're going to lock us out in a few. Oh, okay. okay. One, one more question? Yeah, one more question. Tell me about Carmen Jones. Oh, sure. Carmen Jones, I'm really, I've really been having so much fun working on that. That's a piece that's basically an adaptation of Carmen, which we took a lot of cues from Oscar Hammerstein's adaptation of Carmen, which is Carmen Jones, which came out, I believe, in the 40s. It's the opera Carmen and the story of Carmen, but set in Cuba, set in the 50s, just before the revolution. And every song in the show tries to go through some kind of Cuban filter. So the, the Havanera has like a cha-cha-cha feel to it. The, um, the Gypsy song has a kind of like an Afro-Cuban style called cha cha loca Fu. So it kind of goes through that. We, we take a song that's a ballad in the opera and we turn it into a danzong, which is a very popular Cuban style. So I had a lot of fun working with my co-arranger, Edgar Barrow, who's a brilliant, genius Cuban jazz musician. We just basically like looked at every song in Carmen and we decided, okay, for this moment, this is the kind of Cuban feel that we can adapt to us that feels right and feels organic and serves the story in the right way. And we wound up not repeating ourselves at all. We wound up being able to use like every Cuban style that we could find under the sun and, and it makes for a really exciting interpretation of that score. And when can we look forward to it? Hopefully soon. We don't know. We, we put it up in Paris uh, earlier this year. It, it was a, a huge hit over there. So hopefully there will be a chance for another life. Fabulous. I look forward to it. Thank you, Alex. Oh, my God. Thank you. That's arranger, musical director, orchestrator, conductor, and musician, Alex Lackamore. 
You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.